Welcome to Anecdotal Anatomy, the podcast that curiously explores the stories the body holds and tells through conversations, stories, and practices. Our mission is to connect the individual to the collective through our stories, so we may better understand our interdependence and ultimately live a more peaceful coexistence. Is that too much to ask for? Each episode builds from the last and contains kernels of every conversation we've had to date. We cover sciencey things like fascia, anatomy, the nervous system, and other body-based sciences. We also have a pretty high tolerance for the woo factor, which, let's face it, is also energy and should not be discarded as if it has no value. We are nature-loving, yoga and meditation teaching podcasters that could, aiming to make the world just a little better than we found it. Our motto is, leave no trash trace, we're only visiting, but leave your heart print with every step. Hello, Sherry. <laughs> hey, Teresa. What's up, Mama? Oh, On this what a beautiful autumn day. You know, uh, it is Halloween this day that we're recording. I went to pick up Siva at the lake. And when I left here, it was, you know, your average morning day. But when I got close to the water, I was surrounded by fog. So much fog that I couldn't see like five feet in front of the car. So the water element and the air, the air element was saturated with the water rising up off of the lake surface. It was like a perfect atmosphere for Halloween. It was misty and I wouldn't say scary, but I guess, you know, I looked at some of the trees and you could see all their outlines, but between all of the roots, I mean, all of the trunks, it was just this mist floating out there at the at lakeside. Mm, so I love I that. To, yeah, I paused to uh, sit with the environment for a little bit, and I saw the sun starting to poke out. So some of that fire is going to come to the lake and dry up all the rain because the itsy bitsy spider. <laughs> <laughs> it's Halloween. You got to have an itsy bitsy spider in the oh, intro for sure. <laughs> For sure. There's something about a silhouette, you know, and I mist does that. The mist sort of, you know, blurs the the hard lines of the branches. It blurs the hard lines of those things that separate us. You know, it kind of draws us all together under this this blanket of nature. You know, that it's it, none of us can kind of escape it. I mean, it's all that's if that's what the universe is deeming for the day, that's what's gonna happen. So the way we look at it. I know that when we used to drive into Newtown, when the kids were really little, on the bypass, you know, it, the bypass is this man-made big, like, road. I mean, it, it's a, it was before the bypass, people had to spend an extra 15, 20, 30 minutes to get to where they were going. So it's a little bit of a highway feeling, but it moves into these big farmlands and these open spaces where every time we would drive through there, say, oh my God, kids, just look at the sky, look at that sky. And often when the mist would come in on the sides of the road where there were, you know, farmland and then trees, that silhouette that would come in was, it was magical. And someday it could be spooky at times, but even spooky is magic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's Halloween. called the bypass. I mean, last, uh, last episode, we were talking about spiritual bypassing. Mm -hmm. So, so interesting to see how that word is showing up for us that is and you know what so on the one hand it's a direct route it takes you from where you're going to where you want to be without having to take the detours my mother always said take the detours <laughs> and but there's something we miss something when we are so quick to go from point a to point b and yeah if you're getting to work and you got to get there it's it's useful but in the spiritual work that we do, we can't bypass. We can't go from point A to point B without getting through the thicket. Yeah. Ooh. And that thicket can be uh, kind of thorny sometimes. <laughs> the thorny thicket. I love it. Thorny it, thicket. Reminds, it reminds me of On Golden Pond when the character Ethel Thayer, her name was Ethel Thayer. And was it, what's his name? Fonda, uh, Henry Fonda would say, Ethel Thayer, sounds like I'm with me. <laughs> you know, when he would say it. So the thorny thicket. I love it. <sighs> <sighs> Whew. 
So today we're going to talk about the elements, which, which just kind of organically showed up in each of our mornings today. And, to, you know, in Halloween, there's uh, some of the spookiness that we can, like, we just talked about the mist. It's magical, spooky, mythical. There's just so many different ways to view the air, sorry, the water and, yeah, the water and the air elements mixing. Not enough to be rain, but... <laughs> I just, it was gorgeous. I, I love that kind of a misty morning. Yeah, me too. You know, what is it? Misty water colored memories. That's my Barbara. That's my Barbara. Oh, the way yeah. we were, man. Great Unfortunately, I have nothing of Barbara's voice in mind. <laughs> <laughs> no one has Barbara's voice but Barbara. I mean, she is one of a kind. So funny. We were just talking about that. My neighbor, we've become pretty good friends and we're hanging out the other day and we discovered that we both had a Barbara Streisand obsession. Ooh. I still have vinyl coming out the wazoo of Barb, but I didn't know, <laughs> Babs, I didn't know about some of these recent things that she's putting out there, but that's another podcast for another day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's, repurp she's repurposing as we repurpose. And, you know, you were talking about waking up to the, the kind of the obvious elements this morning. It's hard to miss. It's hard to bypass when it's right there and it's landing on your skin and you can feel the doingness, you know, mixing with the earth of our, our physical bodies, you know, we can frame these elements and our senses, you know, there's five and five, we can, you know, find the poetry in all of that because it's inside us as much as it's outside us. You know, everything that's inside is outside elementally, elementally, my dear listeners. I always did have a Sherlock Holmes thing too. <laughs> yes, we've talked about that, your love of a really great mystery. Yeah. But yeah, the elements are within and without because everything is made up of these those same five elements, which I really find fascinating. Every time I read a little bit more about how everything, you know, from the car to right. our bodies, to uh, the plants, the earth itself are all made up of these five elements, earth, water, air, fire. And of course we all need just a little bit of space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. I mean, I don't know about you, but I kind of go down this rabbit hole sometimes of, you know, grounding in the natural world and imagining what it was like at the very beginning, you know, when we were just kind of in that hunting and gathering pre-industrial revolution, pre-agricultural revolution, pre all of that and how, Everything that we have here from the toxic chemicals to the plastics that are not disintegrating to or, you know, regenerating with the earth for thousands of years. All of these things had to come from originally from the natural world, because that's really the only palette we were given mm -hmm. when we got here. <laughs> and it just it, it fascinates me how we can take something so essential and beautiful and necessary and spin it. You know, we don't know if it's going to be for the good or the bad. Our intentions may be for the good, but then, you know, things happen. And then we're like, oh, but plastic, this is great. It will. And, for, you know, my personal feeling is it should be used in hospitals, you know, places where sanitary, you know, conditions and, you know, longevity and those kinds of things. But how essential and necessary is it really? Paper or plastic? Now we, we see that we're not given the choices. Places are eliminating plastic bags, but I'm, I'm moving off of the, uh, the point here. <laughs> the sit spot. I'm moving off the sit spot. We're moving off the sit spot. Watch out. You know, just to <laughs> say a little bit about that moving from plastic to back to paper, which it was when I was a kid, bags were always paper when, when Same my here. mom brought yeah. them home. Right. But now in New Jersey, I was shopping over there. They don't give any bags. And, you know, I, thankfully always have bags in my car and 90 percent of the time i actually remember to bring them into the store when i go into the store right. but i happened to be in whole foods just i ran in to pick up a couple things because i was passing by completely forgetting that if i don't bring that bag i have to carry each item out by itself or like take Costco. the wagon all the way to my car <laughs> yeah or so BJ's. um one step closer to reusing so and the irony the about reuse. the the whole food situation. I was in Jersey too, and I was pissed because we had done a huge shop and we get to the end and there was no signage. There was no indicator throughout that this would be a thing, but for the delivery from whole foods, 
they send you these bags now. They used to send you these brown paper bags that if, I mean, and I would put my compost in it and then take the compost in the paper bag and put it into the actual compost pile because the brown paper would break down and give some some carbon to the the nitrogen of the, the whole pile. But then they started, and all you had to do was sort of cut off the plastic tape. They had uh, some tape on there, which I thought, why did they have to do that? They make it, anyway, that's a whole other rabbit hole. But they started sending these bags that were reusable. I'm doing loose quotes, which I can't stand. But they also weren't, you know, there was something off about them. And I thought, are these recyclable? How do we, because if you're just going to be ordering in, you're going to be stockpiling these bags that are not biodegradable. They are not. I got into it with the the people online. I was asking the questions, are these biodegradable? What is the long-term solution when you're sending these constantly to people? You know, I've stopped ordering from them because of that, because of those bags. I don't want to contribute until they get it done. Until And I, he's like, well, we're working on it. Well, when you get it done, I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's in person or somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. You know, we worked on our creating our neighborhood a mm-hmm. while back, and it reminds me of a scene in The Good Place in which we kind of structured our neighborhood, and they were talking about gathering points for doing good deeds, right? And that's how you find you would find your way into heaven and how they were calculated. And in one of the scenes... They said, you know, there's so many unknowns in calculating a good deed. And for, I think, I think, so I'm not going to quote anything, but I think the story that they told was, you might think that buying an organic tomato is a really good choice on all levels. Like what could be wrong with that? But when they broke it down, they're like, yes, buying the organic tomato is one good step towards the earth, but it's from California and you live on the East Coast. So there's all the fossil fuel to take it across the country. And they're doing this little tally of something really simple, you know, buying an organic tomato and showing that it needed a little bit more thought for them to gather all the points they needed to up that number. So in the end, in the scene, the tomato decreased their points to get into heaven rather than increasing them. So I there's love a lot that. of thought. That's perfect. That's mm-hmm. a perfect analogy. Yeah. yeah. And that's exactly how it played out. You know, and I thought that's, that show was so profound on so many levels. And I will watch anything with Kristen Bell. I <laughs> have a crush on her. I love her. I, I think she's fucking brilliant. I just watched Veronica Mars. This is like not a new show. I was like, oh my God, she's freaking awesome. So watch anything with Kristen Bell. We love Kristen Bell. Yay, Yay. Kristen Bell. (laughs) So I thought it was worth us taking a trip on Memory Lane back to our neighborhood episodes as a great transition for really diving deep into the elements, right? The elements. And we have so many different lenses to look at them through. You and I have both, as always, done our research. And in the end, we came back with information about how the elements can assist us in life transitions and the elements and how they show up in our body and Ayurvedic medicine. So we have a few jump off points to this conversation. Where do you want to go first? Well, I also love that several times throughout these seasons that we've done, you have talked about the senses as the portals for experience. The portals? <laughs> Where did, the portals. The portals for experience. You know, that we live our lives through taking in through our senses and then and then putting out through our senses. And that we have I arguably more, but five basic senses. <laughs> we can, you know, move on to that later. And then the five basic elements and how those numbers and those experiences mesh, how they sometimes fit together. And like everything, you know, in this research, I'm finding some people are very clear about the the senses that coincide with the elements. And in another one, I found it much more vibing for me. Like for one, they said, you know, air is touch, water is taste, ether is hearing, fire is sight, and earth is smell. And they all give great reasons for why. And I can, you know, if that's the paradigm through which we're going to, to, you know, explore this, great. But then this came up and I thought this was from Ravi Kumar Gupta. And he says, the five elements of life of the universe, earth, water, air, fire, and ether, five senses, taste, sight, t- 
touch, feel, smell, and sound, the connection. So rather than assigning one, because that can be limiting and you know may give us a jump off point to do some healing work, but this felt more sort of globally uh, focused, globally focused, globally aware. The earth, we can taste, see, feel, smell, and hear. All of that is contained. Water, we can't smell unless you're tap water from Philly or somewhere. We <laughs> can't smell it. To be, ideally, you can't smell the water, but we can taste it, see it, feel it, and hear it. The wind and the air, we can't see. Now, arguably, we can't see it in its natural state, but if a flag is flying, if air is blowing in the wind, that's when we get to see it, the result of it, but we're not actually seeing it. So wind and air, we can't see, but we can taste it, we can feel it, we can smell it, and we can hear it. Fire, we can't taste and feel, really I hope we can't feel it, but we can feel the warmth from the fire, but we can see it, smell it, and hear it. Sky and ether, we can't see, taste, we can't see, taste, smell, and hear, but we can feel it. The human body is made of the five core universal elements with five divine senses. And with the connection of consciousness, we get a magical life to live. So we're coming back to the magic. We're coming back to the magic. And I think our misunderstanding of magic is that it's something outside ourselves. It's something supernatural. And, you know, part of, you know, I sent out a newsletter today. It's Halloween. This idea of witches. It's the season of the witch. And the witches originally, the pagans, were able to harness the elements of the, of the planet, of the earth, of all of these, these senses and elements together to create things that freak people out because we have everything we need on this earth from these elements as sort of evidenced by where we are today. All of I mean, the lamp that is on, the electricity, everything we have comes from these elements originally and essentially. Yes. Uh, and I'm sorry for the abrupt. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just really fascinated because there are so many different ways of looking at the elements. I was reading um, my field manual. I like saying my field manual from my class. And one of the great things about my field manual is that it's made out of paper, paper birch. So it feels really great going back to the element of touch. And, you know, when I hold it, I'm able to connect with the sense of being in nature and being with the trees because that's what my outside surface is. So touching the element of trees, which are earth, is an amazing part of me picking up this manual and studying. But there's a few ways that they looked and shared the elements with us also in our training. So for air, it's light and subtle and mobile. So it's constantly moving. And this is one thing that I really liked, and I'm not gonna read everything in here, but um, we had talked about this, I believe it was in season one. The air that we breathe, this is quoted, the air that we breathe is recycled and has been circulating through Earth's lungs for millions of years. So just this simple phrase really makes me believe in our interconnectedness, that the breath that I am exhaling right now is not only being absorbed by the plants in my room and Siva, but for generations to come, that air will continue to move. It doesn't disappear. We just recycle it, purify it, and allow it to keep going. Fire. They talk about fire and in relation to humans because we're the only animal that has mastered the use of fire. Thank so, you, Prometheus. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we are able to take that fire and use it, but the fire, that element that is produced by the sun is also an element that is utilized by photosynthesis for our plants. Also, it converts the energy of growth that we need and offers us vitamin D if we spend enough time outside absorbing the sun's rays. So we are the recipients of that. But in addition, they talk about fire in its meditative qualities, how often it is used in ceremonies like full moon fire ceremonies for a shift to be able to be in a meditative state, 
to calm and relax, to become more present. And even in some ceremonies, trance inducing is one of the qualities they offered about that. Um, water, water is so malleable. It takes the shape of anything that it's in. So if we put it in a glass, that's water shape. If it's in the ocean, that's the shape, but it is able to transform solid to liquid to gas, which I think is really amazing. But they keep coming back to the senses in my book that the rhythm of the waves. So we have this rhythmic sound that flows in and out that also helps if you love the water and you sit there and you watch the waves come in and out and you're listening to that rhythmic sound. It's a way of also, it, it, for me, brings me into the present moment. I could stare at it and feel by the time I'm done, I feel like my senses are restored and my awareness has become more focused when I sit by water. Water is one of my favorite elements. And the one that we have most prevalent inside of our body. We're made up mostly of water. And then, of course, there's the earth, and that is our physical body. So we have the earth itself, the solidness, the support, the groundedness that we get when we take each of our steps because Mother Earth, earth is kind enough to let us walk upon her. But also our physical body, our bones, our muscles, our skin, our organs are all represented as the earth element. And then space, you know, whew, you know, there's little spaces between everything in the body, but also spaces both large and small that exist in, in the earth, in our neighborhood, in every place that we go, we have this sense of spaciousness or lack of spaciousness. I don't like crowds. So when I'm in a big crowd, I really miss the element of space. That's when you look up. <laughs> yeah, that was always mine. If I was feeling claustrophobic at a dead show or somewhere where there were a lot of people, I would just look up. <sighs> That's a good strategy. I am definitely going to remember that one. Space, <laughs> space <laughs> now to drums in space, looking out at space. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, that was it. That was. Oof. I just. Yeah. Oh, I did have one yeah. more thing. Sorry, yeah. you mentioned no. the five senses, the five elements, but also when you were talking, it reminded me that we also have the five koshas. And it seems like this number of five is pretty magical for us right now. Right. And Ben, a lot of this coincides with the chakras, which in some traditions are seven, some are five, like some are four. It's the different in different traditions. But you said something that sparked a memory, a thought, something. And I'm famous for saying I know enough to kill us all. So this is one of those things I can't, I can't source it. I don't know where it comes from, but I have a memory, a recall that, uh, that when we get the vitamin D from the sun, that it comes in through our eyes, that yeah. that's one of the things that, yes, it absorbs in our skin and that there's been some talk, I guess, about sunscreen and its benefit, but also how it keeps out some of the goodness. That's again, I'm not exactly sure that that's right, but the eyes thing was really clear. And I'm looking down at this, and this is fire, the, uh, the sense that it's connected to a sight. And so like even candle gazing or, you know, looking at a fire somehow, looking at the sun, you don't want to, you know, mama always said not to look I'm into the eyes it. of the sun, <laughs> but mama, that's where the fun is. Like, yes, that's where the fun is, but you don't want to look too long at the sun, but that there was something about the, the vitamin coming in through the eyes. And so I found that interesting and how like UV sunglasses can prevent that from, from, and I don't know, again, enough to kill us all, but. What I hope is that if this is interesting to a listener that you might Google or go down your own rabbit hole. And, you know, so much of what we do is spontaneous and a lot of what we do is research. So as we research and we talk and we get into this spontaneous part of the conversation, there is space between thoughts and words to, you know, fuck up. <laughs> so, you know, give us a little grace on that. <laughs> we are not here to say this is what it is, but to open up portals and, you know, spaces for thought and for critical thinking, but also to validate and say, yeah, I get that. That feels right. So don't use us for the test you're having on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Always do your own research because this is anecdotal anatomy, science yes. and stories. So 
you know, although we do a, a lot of research, there are so many different ways to look at our subjects. But you really sparked my interest because, uh, you know, because of my skin, skin, I wear sunscreen a lot. But because I have light blue eyes, I also wear sunglasses quite often when I'm outside. So I'm going to have to really pay attention to making sure I have my 15 minutes of vitamin D time, sunglassless yes. and sunscreenless. And you can always pop a, a vitamin. <laughs> I used to take my vitamin D3 every day and then I ran out and I forgot to get more. I got to get more. <laughs> yes, I do. Have, um, I have a vitamin D because it is, you know, in other research that I've done, Many of us are vitamin D deficient and it does lead to, again, a rabbit hole we won't go into here, but do your own research. A lack of vitamin D in your system can manifest in many, many different ways. Mm -hmm. <sighs> All right, let's dive into oh, yeah. some, uh, some articles that we have read. All right. Oh my gosh, I'm just overwhelmed. There's so much out there and there's so much and I know that you guys are out there thinking, we're going to distill it all down for you. And that's what we're going to try to do. I'm going to start with this article from Molly Rituals, M-A-U-L-I Rituals, where they kind of go into the five elements in terms of Ayurveda. And they're really short little pithy paragraphs. So I'm going to, I'm going to quote from here. So the five elements of Ayurveda start, okay, so in Ayurveda, just real quick, and this is again, a rabbit hole you could go down. we in Ayurveda, they work from uh, our constitution and constitutions are what they call doshas. And there's kapha, which I'm calling kapha because I heard somewhere again, a little anecdotal, that there's no sound or the pH in Sanskrit is not necessarily, but so I call it kapha. Uh, that may be wrong. It could be kapha, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just going to go with this for now. Pitta and vata. And pitta is fire, vata is air, and kapha is earth. And so they only use the three, but then there's all these combinations and the, the gunas, which are qualities of the energy that are also brought in. I don't want to get into all of that, but the thing about vata, and you touched on it when you first talked about air, is that it moves and it is one of the more unstable elements because it's constantly in motion. So when we work from an Ayurvedic place, we're trying to find balance. And so we usually talk about what is your dosha? What's your dosha? Well, I'm a cancer sign, water sign, but my dosha is, well, okay. So I just, and I know I said this in the first season when we were talking about it, when I would do all of my Ayurvedic testing and online, you could answer these questions. They're binary questions or they're, if they're not binary, then they're limited choices and they're very specific and answering them became very subjective for me. How do I see myself? And how I see myself is not necessarily who I am. It's, it's the habits that I've created and the persona that I move through the world with, which is kind of a relaxed, hippie, loving kind of thing, which, yeah, I can have rage and I get fucking angry and I'm the asshole sometimes, which at this time I wasn't really owning. I wasn't owning the part of me that gets up and is fired up to get the job done. You know, so I got no pitta ever in my, in my answers. It was always vata and kapha, which um, arguably is a very rare combination to have earth and air as, you know, the, the actual dosha. I think we're all pretty much tri-dosha. If we're all vata imbalanced and you are vata as your constitution, I, this is, and I'm not a scholar in this. So these are all just curiosities that I have and may dive deeper into at some point, but that's just to give you a little sense of, of what this is. So air, according to this article from Molly Rituals, air is one of the vital elements of life and is something that runs through each of us, present in our nerves and respiratory system. In Ayurveda, air represents lightness, motion, breath, and oxygen. When the Ayurvedic element of air is out of balance, it can either cause hyperactivity when it is in excess or fatigue when it's deficient. The imbalance of air can also affect the health of your joints, digestive system, and the heart too. To regain harmony when air is out of balance, consume foods that have a bitter taste and maintain a steady routine. So, I, and Teresa, when I was reading this and we started getting into the dryness and getting into skin and stuff like that, I was thinking about you so much. So that was air. And so air is also in the chakra system, anahata, which is your, your heart. And so an air, and we were talking to the demon of your heart chakra is grief. And we'll get into some of that a little bit later. Water 
is, and I'm going through this article now, as humans, we are made up predominantly of this element closely related to the other elements of air, ether, and fire. The Ayurvedic element of water is also closely related to the blood, that's our liquid in our systems, respiratory system, the joints, nerves, stomach, and tongue, the tongue and the saliva. So the water element in the body, but I'm curious about the joints. Like, is that about glide? Is that about keeping them lubricated? And how do we do that? And the respiratory system, a certain flow of, of breath. When the Ayurvedic element of water is knocked out of balance, it can result in obesity, stomach and digestive issues when in excess, or alternatively, weight loss, dry eyes, dry skin, and reproductive issues when it is deficient. To regain harmony when water is out of balance, consume foods that are sweet, cooked grains, nuts, oils, and fatty foods. So if you're someone who's getting out in your pad and you're writing stuff down, I know, Teresa, we're doing this because this is what we do. But if you're out there in listening land and you're like, oh, shit, I missed that. And now I have to rewind. Don't worry. I'm going to put the link in the show notes, which is where you access this at all. <laughs> so don't worry. You're going to get all of this. So water for the chakra system is Svadhisthana. That's the water element. That's our sacral chakra. That's where sexuality and creativity and birthing comes in. So, you know, what are you birthing? Some people think it's just about the actual birth and sexuality. I like to think of it as what else are you birthing? Ideas, businesses, whatever, creativity. Ether. Uh, so air was associated with touch, water with taste. So ether with hearing is closely linked to the element of air. Ether is the element of space or emptiness, which I think is, we taught in spiritual traditions that emptiness is form, form is emptiness. This is what this ether, uh, I don't know if that's connected to the teaching of emptiness is form, form isn't, but whatever. This abstract element is one which other elements fill. So if we're talking about space, there's that, then maybe it does come into this emptiness is form, form is emptiness. You talked about the water taking form from being in a vessel. So all of these things are fucking connected. I love this shit. The mouth and ears are particularly associated with this element. However, all empty spaces in the body are in some way connected to ether. As ether is known as the element of space, this is related to any issues that fill these spaces within the body, particularly the ears and hearing. When ether is out of balance, seek to consume bitter tasting foods, but in moderation to regain harmony. And I was thinking also last episode, we talked a lot about holding space, you know, and mm -hmm. what does that mean in this? And when it comes to hearing, ether is one of the elements of Vishuddha, which is the throat chakra where communication is. And I always put ether and vibration, ether being the space, vibration being that thing that we're putting out into the world. And so... This, when we also talk about communication in Bashuda, we're talking about listening. It's not just about how loud we talk, how truthfully we speak, and all of the other things that factor into this chakra point, which is not in this article, by the way. I'm bringing the chakras in on my own. But so interesting. Fire. I'm almost done. Fire. Um, fire is a powerful element in Ayurveda, closely related to ether, which provides the space for it to burn, and air, which provides the fuel. The element is one which is closely linked to the mind of this, like you think of synapses connecting and firing up, expressing itself. This is not what they're saying. What they're saying expressing itself in obsessions, thoughts, and emotions. Fire is also linked to the physical, expressing itself in the eyes and in the body's heat. When the element of fire is deficient, it can result in feeling cold, digestive issues, skin problems, and inflammation. Conversely, when fire is in excess, you may have issues with overheating, frequent urination, and sweating. I'm thinking that's right in menopause because it's all what I'm going. Yep, yep, yep. Is that TMI? <laughs> no, no, no. That's good information. Oh, right? So yes. as we're looking to balance the elements, look and see what's going on and how can we do this? These are practical and, and philosophical. So conversely, when fire is in excess, you may have issues with overheating. Okay. To regain balance, seek to keep your digestive system healthy with consumption of spicy, hot, sour, and salty foods. Well, I have high blood pressure, so I couldn't really go for the salty food so much, but I still kind of do. Anyway, so that is, that's Manipura. That's the chakra of transmutation. That's the chakra of transformation. It's also the chakra, the fire is the element of <laughs> breaking through tribal thinking and breaking off into who you are authentic, who's your authentic self. 
So finally, I'm finally there and then I can, you know, zip it for a while. Earth, wait, what was that? Manipura was, oh, sight. Fire is about sight. We talked about that. Earth. <sighs> so but this is interesting because in some of the things we looked at, earth came first. And when we talk about the chakras, it's the first chakra. It's the grounding. It's, you know, this is muladhara. This is really where we start. But in this article, it, earth is the last of the five Ayurvedic elements, as it is the summation of all the other four elements. Earth expresses itself in the form of our sense of smell, teeth, bones, and nails. It's all earthy stuff. When the element of earth is inharmonious, it can result in a weak body, a sense of insecurity, lack of muscle, and a tendency to feel cold more easily. As the element of earth is the summation of everything else, all foods have a connection with this element. However, to regain harmony, foods that can particularly help are grains, nuts, legumes, and meats. The first three are great for me. I'm vegan, but I, I don't judge the meat. So eat what you need to do to gain balance in your body because there is no one size fits all. That's that. <laughs> and that's my friends. Yeah. And that was the Ayurvedic. <laughs> and I'm going to build on all of that amazing information that you gave us about how Ayurveda looks at the elements. I do want to back up just for a second. And this is a yeah. possibility. You and I don't know how the joints fit in with water. And the first thing that came to me when you said that was that they're filled with a sack of synovial fluid, synovial right? Synovial fluid, man, yes. <laughs> so to lubricate those joints so they move smoothly, when we start losing that synovial fluid, bone starts to touch bone, and that's arthritis. So it brings in a different kind of fluid, right? Because itis means that it's attracting lymphatic fluid as a method of healing. So probably the out of balance, and this is all just me brainstorming what I heard, the out of balance is when the synovial sac does start to lose some of that buoyancy, and we come into a place of imbalance or perhaps dysfunction, and also itis we attract a different type of water. Thank God for you. Thank the goddess for you. Honestly, that this is one of the things I love about you, Teresa, is that you have connection to lineage, but you also have so much information that you have gathered from so many different sources, anatomically, you know, through the massage schools, through all of the things that you've done, which brings discernment to another level when we talk about spiritual practice, because you're not beholden to lineage language exclusively, which I think is really important because we are playing a several thousand year old game of telephone. And so to be able to use the things we've evolved into knowing to balance out the information, I think is so critical. And so many of us can get lost in the rabbit holes. And I know we use that term a lot because we do spiral in, but your knowledge is earth element. It is grounding and it is essential. So thank you for that. It is my pleasure. There's something that happened in massage school that, you know, when I was in high school, I was not a great student. <laughs> I I could show up and listen and be a solid high C, low B student. And uh, that was good. I didn't have a whole lot of work to do. And listening, hearing, using that sense of hearing is uh, one of my highest ways of learning. But when I went to massage school and started to be touched three times a week and also offer touch. So the receiving and the offering of touch, I gained such an, such a more, more depth and understanding of my own physical body, how it acted, how it felt, really just coming out of my brain and embodying my senses. It just, it lit me up to want to know more and more and more. So finally, I became a really great student. <laughs> <laughs> After all those years of, you know, being good is, good is enough, I really did. I do love diving into these subjects and just like weaving bits and pieces of information together. So with no further ado, to build on again, and I'm not an Ayurvedic practitioner, but in all of my different trainings, it's always introduced and it comes to me from different teachers and in different ways. And I find that 
when I hear the same information through different voices, it becomes a lot more a part of who I am. I can understand it when I start to blend the different voices, where sometimes I don't understand something at all. And a new voice comes in. And I was like, oh, that's what everybody's been trying to tell me all this time. So Katie Hagel, again, back at my training, she uh, shared with us an Ayurveda clock. And you just did such a brilliant job of of sharing with us the different types of foods and how the doshas play into Ayurveda and the elements. But I really uh, started vibing with how they show up in our internal clock and our own rhythms of our body at different times during the day. So I'm going to read a little bit about that. From six, and I'm going to talk about it in the AM because that's how she presented it. I assume it's the same AM and PM, but I don't want to go there because I don't know. So from 6 AM to 10 AM is, is signified as spring, but the elements that are most active internally in us between 6 AM and 10 AM is earth and water. And the reason that that's important is because when we get up in the morning, it's telling us that we want to movement. We want movement. We want to fer- uh, and do focused attention work because we're grounded and also a little bit fluid. So when we get up in the morning, and you talk about this a lot, getting up in the different parts of your sadhana. For me, the first thing I do in the morning is go out for a mile walk with Siva, with her motivation and insistence some days, but yes, is to get up, get outside and move. So then they talk about, oh, and also because of this and being heavy, a lighter breakfast is the suggestion to not make this a big, heavy meal, but something lighter because earth and earth and water together, just think about it, earth and water together are mud. So we don't want to add anything heavy into our system. Or clay. Or clay, yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. to, to build a vessel or to create from. So, you know, we, there's the deficient and the excessive, and then there's balance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we don't want to add a whole bunch of heavy into mm-hmm. something that could potentially be heavy. Yeah. But then we get to 10 o'clock. From 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, the element that is highlighted in that time of our day is fire and water. So you can see how it's taking that water element with the earth and adding some heat to, you know, to make it just like it was this morning with all of the mist in the air. And because we have introduced fire into our system in our rhythm of the day, that part of the day is equated with summer. And what we would like to do to stay in rhythm with the, our Ayurveda clock is to make lunchtime our main meal. Because we have the fire juices of digestion really active to have a big lunch and maybe take a walk after it to really enhance the fire element and to get our digestion going. From 2 to 6 p.m. is space and air. And this is a perfect time of the day for things like meditation and contemplative practices because we have that spacey, airy um, elements in our body. We can look at that. And our dinner, again, because it's space and air and the fire element is damping down a little bit, the suggestion is eat before six. And that doesn't work for me most times, I have to be honest, <laughs> because of the, you know all of the other work things that I'm doing. However, to eat a light dinner because our fire element is starting to, you know, come to rest and we don't want to have to digest too much food, especially when we're going to be approaching that early bedtime, which is another thing, early to bed, early to rise. So Circadian the, rhythms. Yeah, the early bedtime, we don't want to have heavy foods in our stomach for that can disrupt our sleep. So thank you for to Katie for sharing all that information. I'm sure I had heard it before, but every time I hear it, I incorporate that knowledge just a tiny bit more into my daily routines. Yeah, I think that's really super important. And what you said about hearing the different voices, and we've talked about this before in terms of teaching, that there is no one size fits all. If they're not getting it, not their fault. This is one of my teachers used to say, 
you'd find another way to say it. And, you know, sometimes that's even interpreted by just throwing synonyms at people. <laughs> and that's not the thing. It's reframing it and looking at things through different lenses, looking at them from different perspectives. And, uh, and because we have different ways of hearing, of taking things in, that one teacher may say something on the, that's the same thing in different way that really lands. And so you were saying that, you know, I, I'm not a scholar in this either, and I forget all the time. It doesn't feel intuitive to me yet. So we talked about intuition and instinct on one of our a couple of times ago. And I think sometimes, and we talked about patterns and how when we recognize patterns, we can sort of almost predict future outcomes based on those patterns. But learning those patterns first or learning the information. So the more consistency we talked about last time, showing up all the time, the more we can consistently take in the information, the more we can better become intuitive about it. So, you know, the Macintosh, Macintosh, the Apple, whatever. <laughs> I'm thinking of an actual <laughs> Apple. But the computer, when they said user-friendly, it's, it's intuitive. It's you easily, to, easy, easily navigable. Well, I mean, not at first. It wasn't intuitive at first first. It took a few times to push buttons and go into menus. And I, when I got my first, I had a math classic too. And my friend, Michael Apostolina, Michael, if you're out there, hi. Michael said to me, push all the buttons, just push them all. You cannot break it. And so that's what I did. And that's how I learned how to use my Mac was that I just kept pushing buttons. What does this do? And curiosity, how, what does that do? This was also at the time where you could name your hard drive and give it a picture. And I gave it that girl. I named my hard drive that girl. <laughs> but that's, you know, another story for another day. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that just kind of... That was, uh, yeah, it needed to be here. Yikes. So I read another article and I really vibed with this one. And as Sherry said earlier in reference to the article she was talking about, it will be in the show notes because there's no way that, you know, we can possibly share all the background information, anything more than the highlights of an article in the time that we have allotted. But this article is called Earth, Water, Wind, and Fire, Your Elemental Map for Navigating Radical Life Transformations by Jesse Harold. And uh, I'm going to read this a few more times because I just, there's just so much in here to absorb. So she begins in this section with, when you're lost in the woods, so you know she captured me right there, rather than crashing through the underbrush, trying to find the trail you've meandered from, and Sherry and I meandered from the trail while we were planning the other day. <laughs> so we didn't sit on the earth to find our, our bearings. <laughs> no, we didn't. And that's her suggestion. You sit down and take stock. This is a quote of your surroundings. And this reminded me, that's the work of the earth element, is to take stock of your surroundings, to know where you are in space. And I really vibe, I really love this because we have something called orientation to place that we'll be sharing in our retreat. And it just sounded so much like what I was already planning. And in Radical Transformation, she says that when we stop and we need to, when we know that we're transforming, that things are happening in our lives, this is a great time to reorient ourselves. And these are quotes to our values, our relationships, our career, and our physical environment to really connect with the earth element so much so that maybe you walk barefoot outside. I just learned recently something called the fox walk, which is a slow walking outside with my toes in the earth. But this is a way to kind of orientate ourselves to where we are right now in whatever that transformation we're experiencing. And, you know, I personally think we're all in the middle of a major transformation. A lot's happened in the last few years. And, you know, we're all looking at new ways of doing things. So in the importance of connecting with earth, slowing down, becoming, you know, taking the time to look at what is in front of us right now and make clear choices. Who have I been and who am I becoming? How am I changing in relation to whatever's going on in my personal life, in the collective, uh, is what's going to happen next? And that leads us into the water element. 
And the words that I wrote when I read the water element are the practice of non-attachment. And I also wrote my sit spot. And in every transformation, I guess I knew this, but I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it, that there's grief and loss in a transformation. Even if we're going to an amazing place and we know that we're headed in exactly the right direction to where we want to be, we still know that there's a getting rid of and a releasing of things of who I used to be, what I used to do, the job I used to have. All of these different elements. And one of the things that she says is that when you're in trans transition, you are becoming, but you're also unbecoming. There's a change. And water is that element of flow and being able to, you know, take it as it comes and glide through. But she also highlights how important it is. And here's this word again to not bypass this step, that in the middle of radical transformation, there is loss and there is grief. And if we try to speed through it and try and bypass it, we're missing a really important step in the transformational process. So, you know, sit down and, and again, back to holding space, to create space for all emotions, whether we label them as good or bad or easy or hard, we want to be able to feel those emotions through our elements or these um, different pathways. As we come to air, that is really this place where, and I've said this so many times, people say, how you doing? I was like, everything's up in the air right now, right? I'm in the middle of a transition. We're in this space where we're no longer what we used to do. I remember when I left dentistry and I was in school for massage, I was kind of in the middle. I was no longer in the office. I was no longer, you know, working with patients and helping people through their healing journey. I became a student. So I was in this space between what I was and what I was becoming. So this liminal space can, for me, when I get there, sometimes I feel lost, not quite knowing where this transition is going to lead. And she beautifully talks about all of, all of that as well, to create the space to engage in our own process and not bypass any of those steps because they're all leading us to fire. And fire is the element of transformation. Just think about what fire does, right? It's, the, it's an element in action. And sometimes I'm trying to rush to the fire. I want to get through this transformation and get on to the next place. Mm -hmm. But she, uh, and I'm going to quote, when we're in the process of radical transformation for a while and you've done the work, Earth orienting to and naming what has changed in your life. Water, letting go of that which is no longer or no longer serving you. Air, that oh so important liminal space between where it feels like everything is up in the air as though you're a blank slate and you haven't quite stepped into the new path. And then we step into the fire, the element of transmutation. This is our time. If you watched our, our live, Sherry and I did a lot of re's in there. And I put <laughs> a few more re's in here. So the fire element, and I quote, is a time for reconnection, reclaiming. It's a time to explore and be okay with what she is terming, uh, what did she say? Safe to fail experiments. So as we're in this process of transformation, making little steps to say that, you know, let me test the waters. Huh, no pun intended. Let me test <laughs> the Puns waters. always intended. Puns yeah. are always intended. Oh. And see if I can try this and try that. And they're little steps that if they don't work out exactly how we anticipated, sometimes not getting what we want, is the biggest stroke of luck we can have. So I was really excited. I am going to read this again. And of course, it's going to be in the show notes of how the elements show up in transformation.
and how they're connected to so many of the other systems. So you were talking about looking, she talks about looking through the lens of grief when we're making these big changes, whether they're positive, negative, neutral, or within the spectrum somewhere. And while, yes. So earlier we're talking about anahata, the heart chakra, and that's love and compassion, how we give and receive love, but it also shares space with grief. That's the demon, loose quotes. So even though I think she was maybe using water as the element for grief, tears are grief. There is no one right answer. Someone made this shit up at some point and we're just able to connect the dots. And so connect the dots as they work for you. But I'm so fascinated by the, the seeming opposites that share the same space, like compassion, love, and grief. You know, that everything that has, you know, excessive, deficient, the positive, the negative, the yin, the yang, that within these opposites, they create a whole experience. And one of the things that this author wrote that I thought was really compelling in terms of the, the work that we're doing and the messaging that we want to get out there, she says, untended grief will find other ways to get tended. In, and I put in the body. It cannot be bypassed despite our desires to exactly do so. I think that you may have read that. But this idea that even if we think we've tended to a story or to a memory or to a feeling that no longer serves, and this is something that I always like, what no longer serves us? We don't always know what that is because especially if we're in the middle of a habit or something that we think is good or was good at some point or served us at some point, unless we're really doing that work to figure it out, it may still appear as if it is. But even under those illusory moments, our bodies will still hold on. Our bodies do not work with denial the same way our minds do. And this is just the way I'm kind of extrapolating from all of these different things that our minds are really, so much of the work that we do are about unraveling mind a bit, sort of tending to the mind because the mind is so powerful and can override certain things in certain situations that continue to perpetuate an illusion or some idea that, oh, this is good. No, we're, we're fine. Everything's fine. You know, ah, no worries that that can kind of cover a whole broad band of, of illusion. And so when we get that adhesion in the body or we are experiencing something of, of illness or something else, we can f work to find balance Ayurvedically. We can work to, you know, look to these systems to help us find balance. And then if we're still experiencing, then we, you know, we're, we're not poo-pooing Western medicine in any way that we, but that's again, part of the whole system. We don't want to negate anything because everything is on the table. And when everything is on the table, we can create the, the healing system that works for us. So if our minds are so powerful, they're saying, oh, this is all fucking woo-woo bullshit, then it will be. You know, what I just saw a quote this morning on my insight timer, and I forget who said it, but it was like, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. Like, that's what it's going to be. And so working with the mind becomes, I think, an essential piece to any healing system. Our mindsets can become so strong and they can be the things that uh, are become tangible. They can become lumps. They can become, you know, you know, frequent urination at night. They all of the things. There's it's all on the fucking table. Yeah. The, I mean, the, you mentioned finding balance. And I think that's an, really one of the, even though I'm not a scholar at Ayurveda, I've been introduced to it many different times, as I said. And there's always little bits that get deeper into my, my knowledge. And one of, you had mentioned menopause earlier when we were talking about fire. And it reminded me that one of the things I learned about Ayurveda in relation to the elements is that like attracts like. And if we want to find balance, we're looking to add the opposite. So for instance, when I was going through menopause and I was having hot flashes and spoke with my uh, an Ayurvedic practitioner that is a good friend of mine, and I was like, oh my God, this fire inside me is going crazy. But the fire inside my body was making my mind go crazy. I was like getting agitated about like, oh, I just wish this would go away. I'm so tired of this fire. So I was adding fire to fire. And what she said was, well, your fire, there's too much heat in your body. So what we really want to look at is ice cream. How, eat lots of ice cream. How can we eat cool? Yeah. How can we <laughs> eat cooling foods? Do so you want to eat foods that are cooling to the system? And what really surprised me about that was hot peppers 
are cooling to the system, which I was like, oh, and I was, put, I, I would put lemon in my water. And she said, don't put lemon in your water because lemon is dehydrating and fire needs water. Add lime to your water because it cools the body and attracts water. So I was I'm like, so curious about that. Like lemons and limes have such a different effect by putting it in water. I mean, I. Well, I, not by putting it in water, by putting it in your body. It's not the oh, water you that it is. Putting the well, lemon I, what, in the water and putting the. Lime yes. in the water, whatever, however we take it. But these two little citrus fruits that just to me, only the discerning difference is a little bit of flavor. But to to deconstruct that and to say, what is it about the lime that is hydrating and the lemon that is not is, I, are, aren't they both kind of diuretic in some way? I That's so interesting. Yeah, I'm. I don't know. I just something remember. to look into. I'm going to take something, a note. Look yes. into lemons and limes. The fucking lemons and limes. Why yeah. look into that? <laughs> but you know, at the base, it was when you're seeing something that's out of balance in the body. Know what it is. If you're sluggish and you don't want to get up off of the couch, then maybe you have too much earth and water in your body. So by going out for a nice long walk, I mean, if I'm like cuddled up on the couch with my blanket, sometimes, you know, it gets hard to say, you know, this is really comfy. I don't really want to do anything. And that's okay if I binge watch TV for one day, because I rarely stop and do yeah, that. But if one day turns into five days and six days, and we're not getting up and we're not doing anything, there's too much earth and water in our system that's making us feel heavy and unmotivated. So how do we increase fire in uh, in that? And it's a really hard thing to do, I think. For me, sometimes when I get in that habit of I'm just going to hang out and really come a little bit of, uh, you know, hang out on the couch person for too long, it's hard to get motivated to add the fire. And even energy begets energy. We know this. Yeah. Yes. You know, and even lethargy can beget more lethargy and action can beget more action. It's you know, I love how you framed it about frequencies, find the same frequency and ride that and to sort of draw away you know, to widen the lens from that. It's, you know, my mother used to always say, give the busy person the extra job because it'll get done. You know, if I'm sitting on the couch all day, I don't have time to do the dishes. I don't have time to, you know, do the things that I need to do. I'm too busy sitting on the couch, you know, but if I'm, <laughs> I'm active and I know that this is true, I feel it in my own body that I've been so productive and active in meaningful ways lately that by the end of the night, I look forward to doing the dishes. It's something else I get to do that I, it, it has an immediate gratification. You know, I sit there, I, with the warm soapy water. And by the time I'm done, my kitchen looks fabulous. So there's a certain gratification to that, that I don't feel when I'm just sitting on the couch, but I have to say this, I love sitting on the couch. And for me, finding balance means finding a way to be able to binge as much as I want because I love good stories. I love television. I love reading. I love movies. In fact, the other day I did have to say, we took the girls to see Dawn of the Dead 3D at the movie theater, Happy which was Halloween. so amazing. Happy Halloween. <laughs> there were, I think, three other people. There was a couple and then some other guy. And, you know, we get to re recline in these chairs. And it was 3D. There wasn't that many great 3D effects. And as we were told, they didn't really stand the test of time. Some of the language is archaic and but it was still really entertaining. And that is, you know, just to say also that everything is on a spectrum. So on the one hand, yeah, it may not have stood the test of time, but we could still enjoy it. You know, I can still binge watch all that I want as long as I'm balancing it with getting up off the couch and doing things that are, you know, I don't want to use the word productive because a friend of mine said productivity comes from the Protestant work ethic. And that is just about, you know, how much can we get done rather than being, you know, sort of active doing meaningful things, which is how I prefer to reframe things. But there's a spectrum. It doesn't have to be either or. Either you're binging and you're on the couch all the time, which may be the case, or you're really overactive and doing too much, which may be the case. But maybe you're like most people and you're somewhere in the middle trying to figure out what your particular particular balance is. Yeah. So if you are sitting on the couch and you're thinking, gosh, I'd really like to get out into nature this weekend, I want to remind you there is one more day left of the Rhythm and Rhyme ret Retreat at Snipes Farm, where we will be exploring all of the elements and nature. We'll be walking in the woods and whew, 
who knows what else is going to show up that day. We have a, a surprise guest oh, teacher on the that's... third day who's yeah. going to offer some Qigong for us. Just about 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. And I can't fucking wait. I have done it with this woman before. The first time I ever did Qigong. And I had an experience that I don't think I've ever even had doing yoga asana um, mm. in the 23 plus years. It was really profound in a way that maybe I could only have because of my yoga practice, because I've learned enough about myself and I can be present. But wow, you want to be there for this. Yeah, you don't want to miss out on the surprise guest and sharing this beautiful, sacred land that we will be exploring. Sherry wrote something that I really like, and I'm going to share it with you as our sign-off. Breathing is beneficial, and the air on the farm is organic. The best in bucks. <laughs> so get your organic air here. It's like bottled water for your lungs, only without the plastic. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh, so I we're looking you. forward. I love you too. This was so much fun. <sighs> so I do uh, wanted to say one more thing before we go off because we talked a lot about balancing and you know, we gave a lot of information that we could in the time that we had. But for those of you who are going through menopause or going through your teenage years, I mean, this is going from, you know, birth to death kind of thing. But this book, Balance Your Hormones, Balance Your Life is an incredible book that Wendy Warner actually recommended to me. She was in our first season. She was one of our first guests. But this is Achieving Optimal Health and Wellness Through Ayurveda, Chinese Medicine, and Western Science. So what she does is she gives you a really nice array of options for ways that you can balance your hormones. And I know we didn't, this wasn't the topic of today, but we did touch on it. So I'm going to put this in the show notes as well, because I have found it to be extremely helpful in this stage of my life. And I wish I had known about it in the other stages before through our, my maidenhood and, you know, childhood and all of that, because there's some really good stuff in here. Okay. That was just my little PSA. <laughs> yeah. You've recommended that book before and I still don't have it on my shelf. So I sh guess I should. I'm sure it has an awful lot about the crone in it as well <laughs> as the transition. Yeah, menopause for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I did that a while ago. So we'll just go to postmenopausal. We'll take that nice jump in. This is everything is a transition. So right. until next time, see you later. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening, for rating, reviewing, and subscribing to our channels and all our other stuff. Thank you for inspiring us to have these conversations and to create contemplative live experiences that move our bodies, hearts, and minds to the rhythm of our highest selves. Thank you for showing up. Feel free to send us your stories, questions, and comments to anecdotalanatomy at gmail.com. As always, we thank our amazing editor, Judith George, Keith Kenny for our fun music, and Cindy Fatsis for our photos. Journey with us as we continue down the roads of discovery, taking the detours and meeting the mysteries. You are our why. See you next time.